Okay, I guess we can start. Um, today is going to be a review lecture because the exam is on Thursday, the next lecture. So <laughs> I hope that you guys haven't forgotten. Uh, I know at least one student forgot and is in like a totally different part of the country. <laughs> anyway, so uh, anyway, so the practice final exams are posted. Uh, homework answers have been posted. Uh, so check those out. And uh, don't forget also that the project is due after the final on that Wednesday of exam week on June 12th. Um, the exam is going to be open book and open notes like before. And the format will be similar to what you see in the practice exams. Um, any questions, <coughs> questions about the exam logistics or anything like that? Uh, yeah, assign seats again, and I'll do the same same thing as last time for the assigning seats. If you have a specific like issue or, or a request for assigning seats, let me know. Uh, but like, there are no left hand desks here, so that's one thing that makes it easier to assign seats. All right, so <laughs> yeah, so I have a bunch of slides here that are like a review of the class. But I'm not going to go through them now. These are a few of my favorite slides. But um, I think you can go through them on your own. Otherwise, it's a pretty dull use of time. All right. Unless, so this, that's, this is the class in 20 seconds, OK? Uh, now, what I was planning to do was spend most of this lecture talking about data modeling, like reviewing data modeling, go through, going through some examples. In class, we did like the lending library, Safe Ride, Music Festival. I think we did a medical office, but um, we haven't had any done like on your in your projects. You've had to do a little bit of uh, data modeling, but that's not a ton of practice. So I thought it'd be helpful, and it's been a while. So I thought it'd be helpful to review that. The SQL query stuff, I think we covered pretty well. I mean, it's been a while, so you have to review that. But I thought it'd be more useful to review data modeling. If you have different things that you want to practice today, please let me know now, and I will try to accommodate. Other ideas? Cool with that. Okay. So, with that in mind, let's move to the document camera and get going. Um, let me see, so that's all right. So I'm gonna actually just go through the the same the questions that are on um, the, some of the, pra the some of the practice questions, practice exam like previous exams and uh, practice uh, exams. And you should expect to get a question like this on the final, similar to this uh, thing where it like gives you a form and it asks you to design a database for it. And so there's there was one on garments, there was one on uh, like medical records, and there was one on skating. Uh, maybe last year's. Um, maybe I didn't post that one. I think medical records was last year. If uh, you have that one, okay. Yeah. So there's. I have three, and that's. I think in order of increasing difficulty, that's that's the order that. Uh, that's how I'd order them. So. The easiest one maybe is this one with garments. So basically, you're presented with a form. Let me maybe turn off this light. Uh, does that help or hurt? It's hard to tell. Actually, oh, I know. I got an idea. Actually, one second. I, if I use this light, then I can 
get the best of both worlds. All right, yeah, that's good. So, yeah, so this is, this is a specification for a garment. I think the idea was like, okay, so, you know, fashion, a fashion designer might have offices in New York City and they, they draw, they, they make some uh, prototypes and, and do drawings of, of, of garments, but they actually are, end up being manufactured somewhere in Southeast Asia or something by a factory that manufactures clothes for many different companies. And the way that the fashion designer and the factory interact and communicate specifications is with some kind of document like this that like specs out what the document should be like. It has measurements for the different parts of, doc of the garment and it shows a little picture of it and, and, and um, yeah, and also has some details about up here about the garment as a whole. So when looking at this, it's tempting to just think that this is a very static thing where like there are like 25 different blanks that need to be filled out and therefore we have essentially like a spreadsheet or a table with 25 columns and every you know every row is a different doc is a different garment perhaps and every one of those garments just has a different value for each of those 25 different entries right but that that, that that's not I mean, and you might encounter the, those kinds of uh, treatments of, the, of this data, you know, if someone in, in the real world. But that's not the best way to represent this because there are, are there some many-to-one relationships here that can be uh, represented more like clearly by having multiple tables. So, for example, these things here, these fabrics. This lists three different fabrics, but in general, a garment can have any number of fabrics. This particular one happens to have three. If we reserved three columns for fabrics, that would be a poor design because it wouldn't allow four fabrics. It wouldn't allow five fabrics. It wouldn't allow one fabric and without leaving two others blank, right? So somehow these fabrics are something that there are... Uh, so even though like overall, the overall concept here that we're modeling is a garment, right? There are other concepts encoded in here. There are other like tables that should exist that have a relationship to a garment that has is variable in the number depending on the garment. And the one I just mentioned is fabrics. Right. So there could be three fabrics for a garment, or there could be more than there could be like there's an empty space here for a fourth one. And you can imagine also there might be a a, a version of this document where there were more spaces here uh, for fabrics, right? And uh, so what other entities are there here that need to be modeled, I guess? Like, wh what's a property of the garment has, which of these things apply to the garment itself that you see on here? Anyone? Yeah. Um, like description. Okay, description. What else? Season, I would say style. What about division? Yeah, so like, why is it that those things belong to the garment and actually none of these other things do directly? Because there's just one of them. And there's, exact, there's exactly one per garment and no more than one. So every garment can be characterized by those four... Like I, I'm making, making some assumptions looking at this, I guess, but uh, pretty reasonably, you could you could say that every garment has these four qualities, these four uh, characteristics: a style, a description, a season, and a division. And then it also has your garments also have these things associated with them: uh, fabrics, and these are measurements of the different parts of the, the garment. But the ones that have like a that have a single they can be represented by a single column clearly that don't have a like many to one relationship where the the quantity varies the ones that have fixed uh a fixed uh, number i guess are the, just those four right so actually we can start off making a design where you have a garment table 
And the things that are stored about the garment are, you know, the style, description, season, and division. So, I, like, somehow I picked out a few of the things listed here, but not all of them. If I started listing, like, fabric uh, A and fabric B and fabric C, like, that, that's okay if I want to store, if every version of the, every uh, garment has exactly these three things. There's always a body, there's always a combo, there's always a rib. But um, clearly, like, the fact that there's a different fabric down here in the rib is a feature pretty specific to this particular garment. Like, not every, like, a pair of pants won't have some kind of different fabric on, on it won't even, like, the notion of a rib won't make sense. Um, so this, this design is, like, technically feasible, but it limits the number of fabrics to exactly three, right? That's a major problem here. And, like, the biggest, biggest thing I want you to be able to do with these uh, problems is figure out how to represent those many-to-one relationships without, basically, without fixing, without forcing the numbers of related things to have a certain quantity but instead allow them to be flexible, okay? So if we start off here with this one table that has these things that always have exactly one, there's one style for the garment, there's one description, there's one season, there's one division, and those are always present, that's another important thing. Um, we can, then we can put the, these other things here in some other tables somehow, right? Any questions about that? How we kind of split them up? So j just the main thing that I noticed about these that made me select these four was that they appear exactly once. These other ones, these other things seem to be, they seem to be two different types of things, fabrics and measurements, and each one of those can appear, it, it would seem, an arbitrary number of times for a given garment. So we're looking at one example here, but we have to generalize to what we think other versions of this would look like. Or we might have two or three copies to look at uh, depending on, on, on the situation, but on an exam in particular, what I'll probably do is give you one example. Uh, so you have to make some assumptions. All right, so for this to be a table, uh, we have to have a primary key which stores the, um, not stores, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's the column which uniquely identifies every row. So that, that primary key has to be different for every row, and what would that be in this case? What's the primary key? What's different for each row among, among these four things? Yeah. Yeah, for this garment table. Style, this Nike 002, probably style. I mean, description would probably be different, but it's a long thing that you wouldn't want to, like, if you're going to refer to the rows in this table, you want, you'd want to use the shorter thing. And in fact, you might have the same description for two different uh, garments. Uh, but let, you would, because this, this has a numeric component, you can guess that it seems like something that would be different for every garment. Yeah. But the question remains that to, to, to solve this simple data, pr relatively simple data modeling problem, we still have to represent these fabrics and uh, measurements. And each one of those have a many-to-one relationship with garments. So every garment has many fabrics. Every garment has many uh, measurements. So, but they're different, right? Like, it's not, there's n fabrics and measurements are unrelated. So we don't have the same number of fabrics as measurements. So we can't store those together in the same table. They have to meet separate tables. So actually, what we end up having is two other tables for these two other concepts, fabrics on the, and also measurements. Okay. And these are going to be items related to garments, but they can, they, they, there can be many of these rows for each garment. So to represent a fabric, uh, what columns do we need here? Yeah. 
style to what which style is that the garment style yeah so this is going to actually going to refer to that so i have an arrow indicating this is a foreign key uh what else yeah Yeah, it wouldn't hurt to write FK. Sometimes that I find that to be a little bit um, more clear, especially if it's a composite foreign key. Uh, but either way, what else should be in this? So we, we're representing this stuff here, right? So there's like there's there's there are two columns here. Yeah. So yeah, question. Uh, Um, for these two parts of it? No, for, for the, that, yeah, for those two parts. yeah, so this is like a fabric ID, which is the letters maybe. Yeah. And then there's, you call it a knit ID, but it's, it's kind of like a, it's a type of, it's a description of the fabric yeah. with in this particular garment, because it's a sweater or sweatshirt, there are different, um, knit fabrics. But in general, you know, it could be other things like, you know, polyester and, and whatever. <sighs> uh, pleather, what have you. It's all uh, possible. So we would say, so this, this one here could be the, um, fabric ID or, fa yeah, fabric, I look, we could say fabric ID or fabric number or something like that. And I would call this the fabric description, something like that. Okay, so we so we take two values and store it in three values. The reason we need three is because we also have to connect this together with the garment it refers to. Right? If this if these were stored in this garment table, you wouldn't need that third value because you'd it would be already directly associated with the style. But it's not. It's in a separate table, and that that's what allows it to be repeated many times for a given garment. Okay. So what's the what's the primary key here? If we chose uh, style, what would be the problem? There could only be one fabric per style. So we could only list that Nike 002 thing once. And when we did list it, it would have one fabric ID and one fabric description. So that's no good. It has to be composite or has to be something different um, than that. Uh, so in particular, we can combine these, uh, the fabric ID and the style. And what that does is it lets you say that Okay, like, for example, you can have uh, Nike 002 and A. That's one possibility. Another possibility might be Nike 002 and C. That pair is different, so those two can exist. That allows it to be a many-to-one relationship, to have a many-to-one relationship, for there to be many fabrics. If we tried to add... Nike 002A a second time, that would fail because that's a direct, that, pr that primary key that these two values are a repetition of what we had before. So the only way to add another fabric to this garment is to give it a different letter for the uh, fabric ID, which matches what we see in the design. So that, that, that seems like a good choice, right? Sound good? Well, on the test, you can add an ID column if you think it's appropriate. But generally, if you don't need to, I'm not sure I would, I think I would, I would, t I would accept that and not take points off. But often it's, uh, it's cleaner and like, it's like just less writing to, to do a composite primary key. And it all, the, the benefit of the composite key in this case is that it enforces, a rest it doesn't, it enforces the restriction I was just talking about here, where you don't allow like fabric A to be repeated. That might, that's in some ways a beneficial thing. 
So it encodes some logic of like what data can be inserted that it wouldn't otherwise be, be encoded if you just had um, some thing here that was like fabric garment ID or something. Mm -hmm. I definitely made an assumption in this garment table that even though I was just looking at one example, somehow I guessed or I, I asserted that Nike 002 was a unique thing. And I used my judgment for that. Um, you wouldn't, I wouldn't expect you necessarily to make that same conclusion. So you might ha introduce a new thing, style ID, that was not presented anywhere here. And it, you know, so that, that could be something that is, was added. Yeah. Um, okay, so that, that's, that's fabrics and, and garments together. And that encodes basically this, par this top part of the diagram. And importantly, it allows any number of these right-hand side things, fabrics, there could be one, there could be none, and it would still be valid. You could have a garment with no fabrics. You could have 10 fabrics, whatever. All that is possible with this design. Uh, and that's not possible in a design that has one table. Okay. So I want you to look at it at an example like this and see repetition. And when, it's, uh, when it seems appropriate, allow that repetition to happen an arbitrary number of times instead of just the exact number that you see in that example. Right. And I'll try to choose examples where you can, where it would be easy to understand and easy to make those judgments. And the other thing we have here are measurements, which in this case, there are like uh, maybe 18 of them, something like that. But in general, there aren't always going to be 18 measurements. The number of measurements depends on the number of marking of like letters there are in the picture. Now, the picture itself, I'm assuming, is not you're not storing in the database. And actually, in the question, I think I, I actually wrote out on the exam that you didn't have to worry about the picture itself. You assume that the picture was stored in like some kind of uh, in, in a different type of, of storage system, like just an, an, a, a JPG file somewhere that you could refer to. Um, but given that you, ha you want to be able to store a bunch of different measurements, you have essentially this, you can see there's a very similar pattern for these as there is for the fabrics, right? They have a letter and they have a description. In this case, they have maybe there are three things instead of two things. Uh, unless maybe you, you you could potentially take this first thing as a, a third thing in the uh, fabrics. You could say that there was like a a uh, fabric type could be a fourth thing that referred to body combo rib that thing right. If you wanted to store that in the database, that would be a pretty good design. And similar, you, you, but you do something similar here, um, where you, you again have a style. That's a foreign key that refers to the garment. But you also need to store these, these uh, three other things, which are like there's some description of the measurement. There's a letter. And there's the measurement itself. Right, uh, but the, for, the so it's it's very similar to this one. The primary key, uh, I I underlined this, but that was premature. Uh, in, in reality, what should the primary key here be for the measurement? Yeah, style and letter. Yeah, because letter is different for each one of these within a garment. Uh, so a combination of the garment and the letter is unique. Letter itself can't be a primary key because, for example, A can be used in many different garments, but as long as that garment within a garment, that letter does change, right? So yeah, that's a pretty simple data modeling exercise. Three tables. Uh, I def think that's definitely doable within the time of an exam. Yeah, question. Mm-hmm. B and C. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
good question. Yeah, if you wanted to make this a little bit more complicated, you could do that. Yeah, and allow have some record of like Yeah, there could be a fabric type. Uh Yeah, well, no, that's a good question. So, um, but first, just to make clear what you're suggesting, this could be like, let we could actually have a fabric table on the side here. Uh, this could be maybe garment fabric. There was an association between a list of existing fabrics and the particular garment uh, where it's used. And then here, the, the fabric table could be, um, and then this will have to change, but you could have a fabric ID here and a description and then so this would be like you know the the cotton rib knit or combed cotton rib knit 100% like those things um these are different types of fabrics and you could use some kind of id like this this here might be the id although it changes across here so i'm not sure what that means but you could introduce a new id i guess for the fabrics, and then here you could refer to it. Actually, we already have um, we already have a fabric ID here, which would be could be a fiber <laughs> a foreign key referring to it. But then the uh, what the the letter would have to be could be stored here, and that would be together with the style and the letter that could be a, a <laughs> composite primary key. So I think I changed the meaning of what fabric ID meant, and I introduced this letter thing to mean what was formerly fabric ID. But now we have now this garment fabric table is like a relationship between garments and fabrics, which creates a now we have a many-to-many -many relationship, where we previously had a, a many-to-one. We still have have actually a many-to-one relationship, but we have two many-to-ones together that create across them a many-to-many -many relationship. So a fabric can be used in many garments and a garment can have many fabrics through this linking table in the middle that uh, joins them. And this allows us to reuse a fabric in many different garments while still having just one place where it's stored, like the description and details are stored. And this would allow us to, you know, if we wanted to, s to change this so that we had more information, like, you know, is this fabric like fire retardant? Is it breathable? Like, what's the weight per meter cubed, you know? Like, we'd have lots of different properties of fabrics if we wanted to, and those could be stored in just one place for that fabric, even though the fabric is used in many different garments. And you wouldn't have to repeat that, like, across every garment, uh, if that makes sense. Okay. All right. That was the... Data modeling of garment. And I believe, yeah, the answer I have on the books is similar to what I had previously, except that was before the um, complication of having a separate fabrics table and creating a many to many relationship. Okay. So the next example I want to talk about is. Uh, from last year's final exam, I think, which is the annual, the medical history form, which, so this form has a bunch of blanks, and in this case, interesting, you know, differently than, than the garment thing, I gave you a blank form rather than one that was filled in, and so you had to look at this blank form and say, uh, yeah, what database would I use to store this information? And just like any other paper form you see, like the nature of pa paper is a limited format. Like if you're going to photocopy a form and give it out to people, like there's going to have to be a fixed number of spaces. But in reality, the data that people write in there can leave some things blank. It can, it can continue on the back. You know, so you, you, you give people a form to tell you what kind of data you want to see, but you're not actually, you shouldn't actually limit your database to store just precisely what you see in the form, but rather that form should be loosely interpreted to fill in um, a data model that really reflects the uh, reality of the situation. 
Okay. So here, yeah, we have we. Uh, this is filled out by patient, so it has some information about the patient, um, diagnoses of the patient, conditions, medical conditions, which have some information for each one, immunizations, and uh, yeah. There's probably a part two on a second page as well, but we're not including that. So how, how would you start analyzing this? Like, what are the different big components of this design, of, of this database? Yeah. Well, you have a certain patient, and you know, like, a social security number, like, you Yeah, yeah. So you have a patient. So that's going to be one table. And like you said, the social security number is asked for here. And that uh, reasonably would be unique for people. It's possible you have some patients that are not like U.S. citizens, therefore they don't have social security numbers. Uh, but let's let, you know you could maybe invent a different way of dealing with those uh, those customers. Maybe give them some kind of uh, made-up number f instead. Well, okay, patient is one thing here. What else is? What's another thing here that should po probably be a table? Uh, yeah. Conditions, um, where is that? Uh, here, like this this thing here. So like there, the way that seemed like a menu, it's a menu, or like a potential menu menu relationship, where like one question types of conditions and one function types of medications. Mm -hmm. So these, the medications, they have a, a diagnosis listed here, so they could potentially relate to one of these. Um, not you don't have to do that necessarily, but uh, let's say uh, condition or diagnosis is one. What else? So if if this is one, then maybe this is one, right? Medications. And um, let's ignore, well, we'll come back to this, but what about immunizations? Like, it's, what's, what's interesting about this is that every part of this form has a different, like, structure. The, the fields are laid out in different ways. So it can be hard to, it's, you can't just say, okay, visually these things look the same, therefore, like, these are all tables. But, um, so immunizations, for example, is not represented as a table, although this one is. But maybe that should be a table too. I would argue that it should be. Okay, so we can start with these four, and it's important. Like these are four distinct concepts, although they're all related to patients. There's a benefit to not putting all that information in the patient table. Just like in the last example, the benefit is that we can allow them to repeat with an arbitrary number of frequency, with an arbitrary frequency. Um, so a patient can have one health condition di uh, diagnosis, they can have three medications, they can have zero immunizations if they're a vaccine denier, and that's all okay. It wouldn't be okay if we had just one table patients that had like, you know, for example, one, two, three, four, five, six, six different medications, you know, medication one, medication two, medication three, those could be different columns in one table, but that would be a poor design because it restricts you to exactly six, doesn't allow you to have zero, except by leaving things empty. And so when you, do, when you would want to do a query on that table that had six different columns for um, medications, it would be terribly difficult because you'd have to check, you have to have a, a wear condition that checked six different columns, you know? So it's not just about storing things efficiently, you know, splitting things up like this in multiple tables, it does store things efficiently, but it also allows you to do queries that refer to a concept in one place instead of in, like, many different places where it's duplicated. Um, so that's, that's pretty important. <coughs> okay. So uh, keeping these, these four uh, concepts in mind, we can create four tables. Uh, the first one is patient. And uh, 
someone mentioned the social security number can be a primary key for the patient. That sounds good. What other stuff is uh, appears just once for the patient? Now, remember, that's the key uh, way to, de to de determine whether something applies to a t whether something should be stored in a table. That thing has to appear once for every row, every record in that table. So for every patient record, uh, what what appears? What do we have one of? Yeah. Yeah, address, uh, date of birth. Of course, in reality, some people might move and have different location, different uh, residences. You could always make this more complicated, but this form only allows you to list one address. You know, so let's let's stick that with that. Um, date of birth, uh, name. Forgot that. Um, in this case, this form allows two options for sex, so uh, we will model it that way. And there's one there's one uh, entry here, and. Anything else? That's the first part of the t table. <coughs> what about, uh, so I, it's, I think it's pretty easy to see that the diagnoses are not appropriate because there's different, there's a list and you can have different numbers. Medications can be different numbers. Uh, what about this stuff down here? Any of this? Further down? Uh, yeah, what do you think? Yeah, this does the this medication independence. It's a yes or no question for the person. I mean, the form is laid out so that it's split away from the other things that are like uh pertain to the patient table, but nonetheless, it still has a yes or no answer for the person. So, we'll say uh medi medicine independent. That that can be a column for the patient which takes a yes or no answer. Um, what about allergies and sensitivities? What do you think? You think you need another table? You, you might. It depends on how you want to model it. So the form gave one space for allergies and sensitivities. So it could be that you write something out, and then whatever was written here gets stored for the patient, and that one thing could be written here. Or you could recognize it's a plural word so obviously there are many things there so the person who's reading this this form could pretty easily split it up into several different entries in which case a different table would make sense uh, so that's a, a gray area could go either way um, so uh, let's uh, let's actually ignore that for now uh, and we can come back to it but we have so we have a patient table here has this inf this uh, basic information for the patient we also want to store um, conditions, medications, and immunizations. So if we start from the top going down, uh, these diagnoses or conditions, uh, can be modeled. And uh, for the same reason that we split out the fabrics in the previous example to a different table, we're going to do the same thing for diagnoses. And that's going to be a table. And to make it relate to patients, just like before with the uh, garment example, we, we want to have some column here that indicates for every row here, which of the people does this refer to. So that's the social security number. So this diagnosis is specific to a social security number. And then it has some information. So whatever the person wrote here is needs to be stored in a database, right? So they um, there's some health condition that was described, a diagnosis that was described. I'm just going to say description is a column and just like that, simplify it and not have to break it down. And I mean, you could, to create a real medical database that was accurate, you could have all, I mean, this could get really complicated, but we're not, that's not totally the goal here. What about a primary key? Yeah. Yeah, you could do composite description social security number. Uh, because you would you would think that for every person you're not going to write the same thing like you know uh, you're not going to write diabetes 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 like three times you might say diabetes type A diabetes type B like they're two different uh, I don't know if you can have those both at the same time but anyway you could potentially write that this would be different so that's that's definitely possible um, you might also come like you could use encode these numbers in the database if you wanted to. 
Cause, cause so theoretically, uh, the person is like s listing one of them as, di as diagnosis number one. You could have the number and, and have social security number and number be a, a, a primary key. But you know whether or not that's a good idea would depend on whether what your judgment is as to whether that numbering is significant. So you might want to throw out the numbering. You might want to include the numbering. Yeah, question? Yeah, you, you could do that. Um, so similar to what we did with the garments, you know, with the fabrics, we started off with a simple design where we listed out the details of the fabric with a many-to-one relationship. But then later on, we decided to make this whole, this separate table for fabrics to allow you to have like a single record for a given condition and then just say like all the different people who have that condition would refer to it. That's possible in this case, but you're dealing with a freeform field that people are writing out. So in order to make that work, you would have to, the data entry would be a little bit more complicated because the, um, like the assistant that was, that was taking this paper form and entering in the computer would, would not be able to just type what they saw. They would have to like say, oh, p let me pick out from a list what this person meant when they wrote a certain thing, right? So they're definitely both possible and, and you know, valid solutions to this as a you know, exam problem, but then in the real world, your choice would depend on you know, how you wanted to deal with that, that data entry. All right, so that's two things, patient and diagnosis. You know, these first two things. Uh, any other questions about that? Uh, the third one, medications. I guess we also have to point this over here t because it's the social security number refers to patient. Uh, medications. This is also something that pertains to a person. Let's uh, rearrange this a bit. Mm, I'm running out of space. Zoom out. Boom. All right. So yeah, so for medications, we have each you know each of these rows, we can see it's already formed in a table, so creating a table out of it should be pretty simple. We can take all these column names and kind of transfer them directly. That's probably a pretty sensible idea. We take the medication name, the dose. The frequency, diagnosis. This is maybe a tricky one. We can come back to the uh, doctor who prescribed it and the date of prescription. Yeah, that could be a way to represent this. Social security number would refer again to the same uh, patient table. And what would the primary key be? Yeah, you could do SSS and name, and name. I think in both these cases of diagnosis and medications, it's not super critical probably that you even have a primary key because these names, these are going to be, um, well, I don't know. If it's a freeform thing, it, ha having these in there uh, sort of prevents you from duplicating, having the same medication being taken like twice but in two different frequencies and doses by the same person which is probably a sensible thing, but then again, you know, the name could be written out in a different way, even though it's the same medication, and then the primary key wouldn't really prevent you from duplicating it. So it's not clear there's a ton of benefit by having these primary keys because, because they, they include things that are like just text uh, entry. Okay. Mm -hmm. It could, yeah, yeah, it could. So this, this diagnosis here could refer to this this diagnosis uh, this table up here and so you could actually try to make this a foreign key so this here for the social security number is a foreign key this is a foreign key you could make these two this diagnosis a foreign key up to here now it, does anyone see a problem with this yeah they have to be spelled the same way that could be a problem let's say and I, I agree that's a significant problem. So if we wanted to do that, we probably would need to follow the other student's suggestion of having like one table with all the diagnoses, a certain like standardized coding for the diagnosis, like maybe just 100 different diagnoses, 200, whatever. 
um, and you would have the, the person reading this form would have to translate from what the person what the patient said they had as a condition to one of the standard sets of conditions and this would and, and similarly for these diagnoses here they have to translate uh, to the standard set that is a problem but aside from that even if the, we solve that by having careful data entry what's the problem in the schema design here when I added this arrow this foreign key from diagnosis to this diagnosis table I think that actually is a problem why is that a problem So in order for a foreign key to work, the point of a foreign key is to refer to another uh, table, to refer to a row in another table. All right, so this diagnosis refers to a diagnosis here. In order to refer to a row in another table, you, ha you have to refer unambiguously to one row in that table. In order to do that, you have to point to a primary key, which uh, diagnosis description is not a primary key because th in this design actually, I mean, this design allowed us to have the same description repeat among different people. So if, if there was a separate, like if this actually is not a true diagnosis table, it's a like patient diagnosis table. So maybe it would make, be more clear if we named it like that. Um, so if we want to refer to a patient diagnosis, we have to use not just a diagnosis, but also actually the uh, social security number. So these two are actually together somehow, and there's, it would be much easier to write this if these were next to each other, but these are like a composite foreign key. So it's, it's the combination of social secu security number and diagnosis together allow you to refer uniquely to one row in the patient diagnosis table, unless we designed it differently, um, in which case. But in, in any case, when we have a foreign key, it needs to point to a primary key. If we remove this, if we remove this arrow, the problem is there. There could be. Let's say the diagnosis is diabetes, right? We have ten different patients who have diabetes, so we cannot we cannot refer to this table. We have to know which of those ten patients we're talking about. If we had a separate table that was just like the, if we had a true diagnosis table, not a patient diagnosis table, then we could refer to that with one column. And then, the, then these ones would refer to that one. You know, you have like one row for the diagnosis. Instead, this design has like many different rows for the diagnosis. It only has unique rows for like the pair of diagnosis and patient. And uh, this, this allows us to, you know, yeah, so maybe this isn't, this isn't like the, the best design, but it's one that allows um, the minimum amount of work for the data entry because it allows you to type in whatever you want for the, the diagnosis. Of course, in this case, that has to, <laughs> to match what's, what's down here. So uh, th that reasoning is not totally consistent. Okay. And what about immunizations? That is down here. Let's make another table. Again, we're making another table because all, there can be different immunizations for each person. Like it's, tr you could argue perhaps that because this is listing out the names of immunizations, that you could have in the patient table a list of like hepatitis B, one, two, and three, and influenza, and pneumovax, and and diptet, and then you would enter the date for that person for all those different vaccinations. You could do that. But that limits the types of immunizations you can s record to just that set, right? Because you're encoding the, the p different possibilities as different columns in that patient table. To so be more flexible, even though the form is not terribly flexible, the form is a little bit flexible because it has this other. So in order to really support this other and to allow you to like list out several different things here and to support you know, different... Uh, copies of the same vaccine on the same person, you can uh, create a, it's, it's a good choice to uh, make a different table for this. Uh, so immunizations, you can have the name. I guess there's going to be a patient associated with it. And then also, what other information do you need for the immunization? 
the dates. Yeah, well, that's what we're asking the the person for. And that this actually uh, could probably store it. And maybe, uh, yeah. So if we do that, social security number again is going to be a foreign key pointing to patient. Um, the only tricky question, I guess, is what the primary key should be for immunizations. Yeah, what do you think? It could be name and social security number. That would mean that a given person can have many vaccinations, but only one of a certain of each one. The problem with that is that hepatitis B appears many times. So, uh, how would you solve that problem? I mean, there, there are two different ways I can think of to solve that problem. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, if you if you made all these three primary keys, which is the same as making nothing, no, making no primary key actually, but if you that's okay, if you did that, then you would allow a vaccine to be given many times for a given patient. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think yeah, hepatitis. The, these three shots are probably like three different formulas, yeah. so. You, it could be that you just give the name hepatitis B1, hepatitis B2, hepatitis B3, and you solve it that way and assume that the other ones are not repeated. But actually, if you like know more about it, I think uh, you know your tetanus boosters are given every 10 years as well. So uh, if you want to have a true record of vaccines, vaccines are given many times to, uh, to... You could either store only the most recent date of the vaccine or you could you can include the date, and I guess we want to store the date. You could make this just the most recent date, in which case you wouldn't need to include it in the uh, primary key. Or you could keep a record of all the vaccinations, even the old ones. If that was somehow important, you could do that and make uh, a three-way primary key. Okay. Questions about that? Oh. All right, so... I think that's that's pretty comprehensive. Let's see how that compared with oh, allergies. <laughs> yeah, I guess we t we did touch on this before. Allergies could either be stored f in the patient if it was one thing that you wanted to write, or you could make a separate table. If we did make a separate table, it would look something like what I have in the answer key, which has another table for allergies. And yeah, what I have in the answer key is pretty similar to what we we mentioned here except that I did not bother to link diagnosis to these diagnoses because of the challenges that we ran into of, of having a composite foreign key and requiring that these things match precisely. Yeah. All right. Um, let's take, let's take a one minute break and I'll rest my throat, drink some water, and then we'll continue with the figure skating example.
Okay, so the figure skating example is uh, is the most challenging of these because it's the most complicated and the form is kind of hard to interpret. But the one one of the differences here is that this form actually has two different copies. So up, if you look at this, you'll see that it is storing the like judge like the, essentially the results of a figure skating competition for one skater here and then below there's another skater. So you have two different copies of the form. By having two copies uh, you get a little bit more information about what kinds of things can change and that sort of helps to uh, to interpret it. All right, so let's zoom in just a little bit because this is tiny. Uh, yeah, so can anyone tell what this, so I'm showing you, I'm claiming that half of this form is, uh, that the second half is kind of a repetition, but what, what is unique about this, this, this half of the page here? Like what, what does this apply to? All this information is related, is connected by what? Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is one person, KG Tanaka, and below there's a different person, uh, Michael Brzezina. So this one is this is for skater two. This is skater one. This skater got 17th place. This skater got 18th place. You see the rank listed here, and these are both uh, in a certain competition, the ISU World Figure Skating Championships of 2017. Okay. So by recognizing that, you, can, you, you should be able to tell that one of the important concepts here is a skater, I guess. What else is there? Yeah, judges. Um, sorry, there's, there's a lot here. Um, there's a competition, all right? Uh, so f this ISU World Figure Skating Championships is one competition. There could be many different competitions. Um, then within each, so this this like set of, set of boxes, these three boxes here, they represent. It's true that they are unique to the. Uh, person and the competition, but what do they store, like what is all this information about for the person and the competition? Like what would you call that? This whole thing, what would you, what would you call this whole thing? Yeah. Yeah, it's a score sheet or, um, yeah, it's a score sheet. It's, it's information about their performance, right? So the score sheet is unique for a single performance, if that's the right word, um, like an association between a athlete and a competition really leads to a score sheet. And then within the, that score sheet, there's a lot of stuff, <laughs> a lot of stuff going on, and um, some of it is like some elements are, are present once per score sheet, and then other things repeat within the score sheet, and we have to somehow. Uh, figure that out. So what is what what are some of the what what are some of the elements inside here inside the score sheet that might deserve special treatment? Like what what's repeated inside the score sheet? Yeah, there are many elements per score sheet. Elements happen to be the like different moves that you do in the routine. They call those elements, like jumps and whatnot. Those are elements. What else? Yeah, components. components. Yeah, down here. So there, there are like what thirteen rows for elements. There are five rows for components. 
And then within each of those, there also is repetition, right? In this X, y, X dimension. Like, so for skating skills, there's not just a single thing, but there are many things. Like, what are these many things repeated for the elements and these components? Yeah. Yeah, so the, every element has not just, it has certain things that are like, that has one of, like the base values and the grade of execution, GOE, but then there are many judge scores for each of those elements. So a judge score is something that is going to be part of the schema that, you know, is repeated for a given element and for program components. So we have like seven different things potentially seven different tables, maybe, that somehow need to be uh, mapped out and related to each other. So to make sense out of this complex problem, uh, it helps to start with something that is uh, like central to the problem and, and will connect to a lot of things. And uh, what, what would you start with? I guess there's no one right answer, but... Um, like, what about this this thing here that we're looking at is a scorecard, let's say. So let's, uh, let's start with the scorecard. All right, so what is a scorecard? Like, what, what identifies a scorecard? I think we, already, someone, we touched on this before. There was a skater and a, perform and a uh, competition, right? And those are those are the primary keys composite. Like so, for every skater and competition together, uh, they have one scorecard. And what is what's we need to figure out what columns should be in the scorecard table. And that is a little bit of a challenge because there's so much in the scorecard, right? So to figure out what should be in the scorecard table. Apart, I mean, there are many things that are going to refer to the scorecard table, but if they if those things repeat many times, then it's better to put those in separate tables and have a many-to-one relationship, have many rows. For example, you can have many different elements for each scorecard. Instead of taking these, like, you know, 115 different numbers and make 115 columns in your scorecard and, like, enter in each one, even though technically maybe... The format is the same. Maybe there are always 13 elements. Maybe there are always five different program components. Even setting that aside, it still could probably be a better design to uh, break those into tables and not have one, one table with like 115 different uh, columns. Okay, so, but what is, what is there one of for the scorecard that we can put in the scorecard table? Aside from, we know there's one skater, there's one competition. What else is there one of? <laughs> Things that appear once in the scorecard. <laughs> These are like things that are not repeated. Um, in the middle, there's a lot of repetition, right? In the two different dimensions. But around the edges, there are things that are only there once. All right? So like um, maybe the nation, although in reality, this nation is probably a property of the skater, which we don't want probably to encode on the scorecard, but on the skater's entry. Um, like the start number, uh, the total score, total element score, there are various like total score things that are uh, related to the scorecard. In other words, related to that particular skater's performance at that particular competition. So like your starting number could be recorded there. Total segment score. Um, total element score. It's debatable whether or not you need to really store these things. It could be that maybe you can add up some numbers elsewhere to get the values, in which case it would be redundant and possibly conflicting to store them. But uh, we could just go ahead and store them. And, you know, other things like other totals that are listed here. Total deductions and so on. Uh, there pr probably are other things, but those are the kinds of things that would be uh, listed for the scorecard. That makes sense. Uh, but this, 
this skater and, and competition, those could potentially refer to other tables where you have details about the skater and competition, right? So the, to allow these scorecards to like repeat in different, um, to, to have this database, rep database represent like a whole uh, career of performances, you can have a skater ID perhaps and skater name or the name could be the primary key. You could have like the home country, that kind of stuff stored there. You could have a competition table, which stores a competition ID. Uh, and other stuff about it. But that's kind of, that's not really too, that's not super interesting. The really interesting stuff is all these numbers in the middle and somehow storing them. Okay. So if we want to start storing these elements, I, I would argue that, okay, we see that there's a many-to-one relationship between elements and scores. There are like roughly, there are 13 elements per scorecard. So let's make a table for elements that stores all those 13 different things, right? In order to make those apply to a scorecard, we have to store the a pointer, a reference to the scorecard, which in this case is actually two things, right? A skater ID, let's just say skater, and a competition. But then in order to allow these to, uh, to have more than one, you have to have a second, another thing that is that uniquely identifies the various different elements for that scorecard, which would be what? What's different for all, th all 13 of these things? The number, one through 13? Or the name? Well, like the number's a good one too. So the number skater and competition could be a primary key that allow you to have numbers one through 13, different elements, uh, which might have a description. And you can have many of those from the scorecard. Let's try to see that. Okay, but right now I don't have, I just have like this stuff. I don't have any of this. So how would you store these things on the right. Like what What about b base value and grade of execution GOE and scores of panel? These things appear once per executed element, right? All right, so for every element, we have one of these, one of these, one of these. These are different things. They're not, they're not repetitions of some broader concept. So you can have base value, GOE, and also um, scores of panel. Those can be elements, those can be uh, columns of the elements table. But I would not store any of these numbers here in the middle because there are nine of them for one element. Technically, you could have nine different columns in the elements table, but that would be a bad design because if you're looking for, you know, writing queries that look for a particular type of score, a particular numeric score across all the judges, across all the elements would have to look at seven different columns. That's a, that's, that would be a really messy query. So instead, we can, to represent all these different, like the sec, so we, have, we had one dimension here of many to one where there are many elements per scorecard going down here, right? So that, that's how we got uh, this, these two tables. But then there also is a second dimension where there are many judge scores for even for each one of those elements. So we got to add yet another table here, which is like the judge score. And this refers, it, this takes every one of these elements and adds many different values. So to do that, you need to take the primary key of this and add another element to it, add something else to it to make a, a more specific primary key. So here we're going to have skater competition. And also the um, element number and the judge number. And those four things together 
the, these three together will, will be a for, uh, foreign key pointing to these three. Composite foreign key, and then this fourth element allows it to repeat. And then we have the score, which is just that number. So this table here rep re just represents each one of these numbers in this middle of this matrix gets a different judge score uh, row here. And then the, <laughs> the judge number changes what, which of these columns you're referring to in the original form. And then these three here, the skater competition and element number, choose among the different elements because that's the primary key in the elements table. Yeah. So that's fun. All right, I think I'm going to leave that one there because, uh, yeah, I, uh, that's complicated enough to get you thinking, I think. And there's a, the answer key has a, little, a few other elements that make it a little bit more complicated, like, okay, how do you represent co components? Components are kind of like elements, and they also have judge scores. And there are also these little markings here where there are, like, annotations, actually. For each of the, so for an element, you might also have like a footnote that says credit for highlight distribution, base value, multiply by 1.1. So to represent these footnotes, you actually need another table that refers to the elements, uh, which is, is kind of cool. All right. Any questions about that? All right. So that's that. All right. So you have like five minutes left. And we talked a lot in this class about data. And uh, I think many of you are excited to use data to solve problems in the real world. And um, that's good. I'm, I'm glad you have these skills. They're, they're quite useful and open up a lot of doors and allow you to do quite some interesting things. Um, in the business world these days, there's a lot of focus on data-driven decision-making. And this all kind of goes back to uh, this guy called Taylor in the early 1900s, who was kind of a quack, who like measured uh, factory workers with stopwatches and drove people nuts. Um, he was eventually uh, discredited, but then the people who learned from him are the people who founded the modern uh, business school. So people like Peter Drucker uh, have uh, like th this uh, mindset that motivates how MBAs are trained in this uh, in scientific management. It's called so the, the practice of management uh, management of businesses is done in is uh, attempted to be done in a scientific manner, meaning it's based on data, right? And uh, the famous quote that's often referred to is if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. Or alternatively, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Um, and there's some truth to that. And obviously data is helpful. And there are a lot of cases where businesses do poorly and, and organizations do poorly because they have no idea what's going on. And the reason why they have no idea that, that what's going on is because they are not looking at data. Um, so I don't want to uh, like discourage that line of work. And certainly like, you know, I'm teaching this because I think it's important. Uh, but I want to also, in the you know a few minutes here at the end, point out that data is not like data can lie. <laughs> uh, so data can easily be cherry picked and misinterpreted. And um, focusing on on numbers that come out of data is is easy and it's it's attractive, but it can lead to important long term issues if uh, you end up doing if you if you base all your decisions on analyses that limit that are data driven that limits you to the uh, looking at, uh, you know, if we're talking about biz the business world, looking at only the qualities of a business that can be queried and measured. And there are other important parts of a business that can't be measured. So actually, uh, this logic that if you can't measure it, you can't improve it, that's not actually true. That's just a, like a, a little, like, uh, a little mantra that, that sounds good, but it's not really true, right? Customer satisfaction, employee morale, your brand image, long-term sustainability, um, those things are really hard to measure. You can try to take surveys and stuff of employees and, and customers, but you often, like, if you're going in as an analyst, what you have is what the what's already in the database. What you have in the database are transactions, uh, things like that. Um, you don't have a lot of information about, uh, you know, your the brand image is not <laughs> anywhere in the database, really. Um, even though, like, those are undoubtedly important and they have an impact on the uh, the business, right? You can't really write queries that... that um, that use it or that, that test it, right? So the the reality is when people focus too much on data, they end up uh, following the mantra: if you can't improve it, measure it. So you can, it, measuring things makes it, sometimes makes it seem like you're you're doing uh, useful th work, but but um, it's not always helpful. And, and to uh, demonstrate that, 
I want to look at this this one little example from um, it's from a book called The Management Myth by Matthew Stewart, which is really great. Um, about it's specifically about management consulting and management consulting consultants. I think are the worst offenders of like going in and doing data analysis in a misleading way, <laughs> where where it actually looks like it's helpful but it's not. And so here's an example uh, of an analysis of data that is was commonly done by. Uh, management consultants in the early 90s, and probably is still being done. Anyway, you take a company, right? And there are lots of customers at the company that, that, that are buy things and that have costs. Somehow you go through and figure out how much it costs to service that customer. And you figure out what the revenue was from that customer. And for each customer, you can figure out what the profit from that customer was, right? And you take all those profits, and you actually sort the customers by their profitability. So this chart is a cumulative distribution, which is a little bit hard to read if you haven't seen these before. But what you have basically is like as you move along the x-axis, you're looking at a larger fraction of the customers. So at the end, you have 100% of the customers, and that's where you have 100% of costs, profit, and revenue, right? But early on, you're only considering a fraction of the customers, and you're, you're starting off with the most profitable customers, and you're adding later on the less profitable customers, okay? So early on, if you only consider 10% of the customers, you have a certain amount of revenue, a certain amount of cost that's less than the, than the total, but you have a lot of profit because those are the most cu profitable customers. Okay. Anyway, by, by splitting up the customers in different buckets and, and considering them separately, you can look at a plot like this and say that um, if, we so if we somehow focused on, like th our profit could be higher if we worked with fewer customers, right? Because 20% um, of the customers are contributing are more the, if we looked at only that at some point we have some customers that ha, that are uh, actually cost more than the revenue we're getting from them, and we have others that are actually give us a lot of revenue but don't cost very much at all. If we could somehow just focus on those top twenty percent of customers, our profit could be thirty percent higher. Does that plot make sense? Maybe. Okay. Um, what's the problem with this analysis? Does anyone have any ideas? So like you come in, you do data analysis, you say, okay, like I figured out that 20% of your customers are really profitable. If you just focus on them, you could make more money because these other customers, like they're always calling up customer service, we're sending reps to them. It's like the person who always calls up Comcast to have the truck come to their house every like week. Every time that happens, it like wipes out like a whole year of profit for Comcast. Actually, every time you call them on the phone, it wipes out a month of, of profit for, for Comcast. They don't want those customers. They want the customers who just pay their bills and shut up, right? <laughs> so, so, but, so you go in as a consultant, you say, okay, if you just worked with those good customers, you could be making more money because you don't have to waste all these resources on these, these other customers. Like these ones in the middle, like they're not contributing to profit. They're just break even. These ones at the end, they're terrible because the cost is so high for those customers, but the revenue contribution is pretty low, right? So let's ignore those 80% of customers and we can make more money, right? The, the flaw with, the, with this analysis is it looks good, right? It, it, it's, it's a, um, it looks like a, a thing you could do to imp imp make your operations smaller and leaner and, and make more money, but it's based on a simple data analysis that doesn't really think about the real world. So the problem is it assumes, like for example, that you can drop bad customers without losing good customers. Like if you suddenly decided, if Comcast decided to, to shut off 80% of their customers, those other 20% are not necessarily going to stay because if all your friends are not using Comcast, then maybe you're not going to use Comcast, right? There's some like network effects and there's some like brand image that would be tarnished. You might not be able to produce a high quality product if you only have a small market share, right? Um, so market dominance is an important factor that attracts customers. So you might lose your good customers as well when you get rid of some bad customers. It also could be that your per customer profitability varies over time. So the, the good customers this year might be bad next year, and this year's bad customers might be good next year because might, maybe there's a big setup cost for customers. Like initially the truck has to come to your house to install the cable, and it, 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 you're a bad customer that year, but then you're a good customer five years later. Right? So a very naive, a data based analysis, a, a, a data focused analysis without thinking about the broader picture can lead to results that seem it can, make you, it can make you look smart and, and give advice that seems really good, but actually is harmful because you're not taking into account things that are not in the data, okay? 
So use data wisely. Um, ask yourself what's missing from the analysis. What are we not measuring? Because it's, it can't be measured. There's no data. The, the results change if we look at different time periods. Um, so I, behave like a scientist. Test your assumptions. Don't just stop when you get a number uh, or a plot because it could be quite useless and harmful. Okay, so uh, fine, that's, that's it. Um, see you on Thursday for the exam, and thanks for taking the class.